Hello and welcome to Dive For Ya. I'm Dracos, joined this week by Kobe and Azale. This podcast, of course, is available on Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud. We didn't get the D in the script. SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud. and uh, Come Anchor. on, read it correctly. I'm working on it. I have no idea what Anchor is. I guess that's a dive thing. It's a, I haven't heard of that platform before. Yeah, yeah they send us in voice questions on Anchor. That's why we have it. Yeah, oh, cool. Yeah, it's, Maybe it's, we'll get Anchor. It's kind of like just ripping off Hotline League because Mark's on that and he's also on the dive, you know? I think stealing from Mark Z is something we could all get better at. Well, he's more, it's more stealing from Travis because Mark is on the dive. Sure. So well, I think what we should do is we should also start a book podcast. We should just always compete with Travis Gafford yeah, and whatever yeah, yeah, he's yeah. doing. And against an impact. Yeah, they started, Wait, they started against it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. that is degenerate. Okay, I, I take it back. We I, heard, take I heard Travis is against in whale. Can you confirm or deny? <laughs> I would not be surprised. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if this is the based last, on any fact. The last I heard, though... He was not. I, okay. The last I heard, I think Ovali probably spent the most of like Ovali, Travis, Mark. <laughs> That's believable. <laughs> to be fair, Ovali being number one is not surprising. Travis no. being number two would catch me off oh, guard. Oh, yeah. Well, Mark is for sure free to play. So Travis is... Oh, I know Mark. Default. Mark is not a man who spends money <laughs> on anything that is not absolutely necessary. I respect that about him. All right. This has been uh, your NA influencer update segment, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. segment. Yeah. Here on, on the subject of off topic things obviously today we're going to be talking about um world's semifinals and of course the upcoming finals between dom and kia and edward gaming but before we do that um the off season for the west does not wait for <laughs> our lpl lck for this finals. little thing yeah, called the world finals. finals what even is worlds for us you know a brief interlude in our otherwise i mean very- i can tell you what the world finals is it's who's gonna get perks you know that's the real <laughs> world <finals. laughs> that's the real <laughs> challenge yeah. hold on How we already know where he's going for? basically <laughs> so let's let's put it somewhere else uh, yeah. about that how much money will uh eastern support sword art so far setting the record on Import, oh I think, my import salaries. We need to see if anyone could top it this year. I was How much it. will Barrel get? How much will Carrya get? That's my question. Yeah, I mean, it, it's actually pretty fun with all the rumors sliding around and stuff. You know, you're waking up, new hot news. Where's it going to be? We've we've had, like I said, the um, you know the perk stuff has had a lot of people yeah. like reaffirming the rumors of Perks and Alfari both going back to EU and, and being on that Vitality Super Team, which is a super fun story. Then there was another one that was emerging, you know, surrounding Hans and Inspired and Mickey and stuff. But Jack's or uh, Jack just yesterday, I believe, tweeted out that this like very serious looking tweet saying that those people are confirmed not going to be on Cloud9. Yeah. Uh, even with like a completely no hint of a joke tweet, though, people are like, hmm, can we even trust this? You know, all the the different levels of people spreading rumors has gotten kind of crazy. I think that's the best and worst part about these offseason rumors is just like nothing is reliable. The only thing I will say, and this tilts me every year because at least one pro player or coach talks about this every year, is that like if you are an organization and you see a rumor floating around and you're like, oh, I guess I won't contact that player because they've been yeah. confirmed to join you know, pants on head gaming. Like, please don't do that. Yeah. That happened to so many players. Like, I grab tweeted about this series. Like, I've got people, t- you know, sp- putting rumors out there that I'm talking or have joined teams that I have not even spoke to. Yeah. You know, and luckily, I, I think, like, he's maybe, he's, uh, like, he's maybe got some stuff in the works already. I'm not 100% sure what, if he's confirmed on anything yet. But, like, that, that's, I know Odawamne had a season where he joked, like, yeah, guys, going to G2. And that's his own fault for sending that tweet out there. But he was, like, joking in an off-season way. And there's a lot of people who've gotten screwed by rumors. I, I think that the, if you're a good agent and good teams and with good scouting, you need to now just always operate in the world where there are tons of false rumors. So... Like you're saying, do yeah. not base your team strategy for recruiting off of, oh, I Twitter heard rumors, rumors yeah. from the Fluffy Sheep account or something, so <laughs> and I guess we you know, can't credit get the to LEC we want. Wulu. I think high accuracy rating. I'm not trying to discredit LEC Wulu, but I'm just saying, like, if you were an org, maybe just ignore all rumors and proceed as yeah. if yeah. nothing had been exactly. said. Because what's the, what's the drawback? Oh, wait, they said well, no. Well, the, the drawback is, is this, and this is why it gets a little bit more complicated. I want to sign Dracos, but Dracos is signing with you, uh-huh. right? And if I, if I already think that he's signed with you, then I need to be looking for other players because the players do get snatched up. And that is the problem when I've, when I've spoken to some of the GMs and, and people who are, who are trying to make mm-hmm. these decisions is that they're saying the, the players and the agents are going to try to string you along as long as they possibly mm-hmm. can and never give you 
a confirm yes or no because yeah they want to jack up the price. they want to jack up the price exactly and so they they want like you know draco isn't gonna say no to me because he's gonna try to keep getting me to offer more so that then he can go to you and say hey kobe well isaac was offering me 10 million so could you do 11 you know and and that's that's where the problem comes like it seems obvious like don't listen to the rulers the rumors dummy but if you think it's confirmed that that this person is gone you need to get other people you need to have a roster signed especially if you're a top team and are trying to like compete for worlds there's only like a couple players often that you can really choose from then. Yeah. Mm. That also brings up the point of time efficiency because literally every GM that I talk to is just always looking forward to or dreading this period because they get so much less sleep. Yeah. Like you're just your time in the day is all filled up. So as much as it's funny to, you know, we're joking around like, oh yeah, I just ignore whatever. Be you know, the the time allocation of going after the next player and trying to eliminate stuff that is yeah. is a waste of time is actually a big deal. So it, that's a good point. It absolutely is because it's like, you know, if you're like, oh, okay, I could get like Perks or Bjergsen or like whatever, right? You know, if you're mm-hmm. going between those two players and you're like, okay, but I really want Perks and you keep waiting, you keep waiting, you keep waiting. Then by the time you find out from his agent that he's actually officially signed and it's a done deal, well, maybe Bjergsen isn't available anymore, right? And that And that's the reality that the GMs have to deal with. And that is why I think that the rumors can be damaging Mm-hmm. because if, if you're a GM and you think, okay, well, yeah, I know this is a rumor. It's not a signed contract, but it's pretty a pretty sure thing. And you buy into that, then you have to move on that information. You have to act on that and move on to a new player because you must get your roster together. Yeah. Once players are signed, you're out, you're out of luck. Well, and I think it, obviously there's someone sitting outside of this process. I've also had talked to GMs about it, talked to players about it. I think it is, it is just this this struggle where obviously both sides want to hold out for the best offer possible. Yeah. Players are going to do it. Players with their agents are going to do it. And orgs are also going to do it too, where maybe there's two players and they kind of Especially want more Especially if you're not your number one. That's yeah. the fun of the game, yeah, baby. If you're not, Everyone's if you're not playing chicken. The perks is of the world, you know, where you can have your pick of the litter. If you yeah. are a more mid-tier player, I think you're in a similar boat where teams are going to put you in a similar boat too. So it is just such a convoluted mess. Yeah, and th- and that is that is what I don't like about the all, all how crazy the rumors are getting because I have spoken to a, a number of people as well who are like literally i had one dm or this person messaged me on discord one time we barely even talked about anything and now i'm seeing confirmed that i'm on their team and i'm just like people are being irresponsible i think with, with it and i enjoy the rumors i enjoy following along with it too but i'm also aware that People shouldn't be posting shit unless it is like a done deal, right? And that yeah. and that is the the damaging part about it. But I think people um, are are sometimes not verifying because they want the clout and they want the like the attention. Um, and and I know people are trying to verify, um, but having spoken to some of the people that the rumors are about, it's like seems like ah, you didn't really do your due diligence here. Yeah, and and there is a, a lot to be gained for following. You know, there's since there's so much hype, there's going to be a lot of viewership for, uh, oh, yeah. you know, releasing the rumors and followings and stuff like that. So there, the gain is there. So in the real world, when the stuff starts to leak through the cracks, it's gonna it's gonna get out there. Yeah, definitely wild though. I'm I'm we haven't gotten anything as crazy as the Whippo roll swap rumors, which turned out to be true, which was really the craziest rumor I can. I mean, the Jensen Bjergsen rumor is pretty crazy. I, think. I actually, wait, I didn't hundred, I didn't, I never saw anything about that. I just heard, is that, I heard updates on it. Is too. that Jensen swap? The rumor is Jensen swapping to, to AD carry, to AD carry with Bjergsen playing. So mid? yeah. So, the like uh, the, the Danish updating. super team in North America, <laughs> well, the one we've been built waiting for for years. So the rumors like just keep coming, and I don't know how many of these we actually want to touch on because we do like propagate them this way, but um, you know that it is funny on the one the hand to be like, where- guys, these are potentially dangerous, <laughs> but also this one is so juicy. Exactly. <laughs> um, they I they they were like trying him as AD carry now Ooh. maybe not so much confidence in it anyways things are still in flux and that i personally don't have a lot of confidence in it because while it did work out in the unique like you know caps and perks situation uh, i think that that role stopping and having that sort of impact and being top of that new role is really difficult yeah. that's why it's so impressive when it does work the other thing on the agents as to not just them trying to get best price for individual representatives that they have but in esports a lot of them are representing so many different players and they will have this inventory of somebody's at the top somebody is the star player and they try and like shuffle out and get you know get rid of inventory that's 
towards the bottom that at a higher value too, while like doing weird shuffling stuff. So there are so many things. I mean, just, I have so many friends that are GMs and just all the stories that they talk about in the off season yeah. are just, some of them are just mind blowing. How Absolutely. how much shady stuff goes on in like trading That's different things. you really things. gotta it's, trust your agent. That's like one of my biggest takeaways from yeah. any of this stuff is you gotta be damn yeah. sure you you trust the person who's who's working for your interests because yeah, some of the stories are, are not good that I hear. Yeah. Well, you gotta hope for the best. I think we'll leave it there. Not yep. that I don't no, we should. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we'll probably and each we gotta, do we our gotta own get into respective worlds. ops. You know, we'll do our roster rundowns and the next year starts for both of our respective podcasts. But we'll get into worlds. Luckily, none of these teams are changing players yet. We don't have a G two vacation situation where any of these <laughs> players know that they're benched coming into this one. Um, but we'll kick off with semifinals first. Uh, that we know of. That we know of. <laughs> We'll see if there's any drama in the final days before Dome Monkey versus EDG. But, of course, both these teams played their respective finals. Um, both five games. Pretty crazy weekend. Semifinals continue to deliver internationally. But let's start with um, T1 versus Dome Monkey. This was, this was tense. We got to cast it. It was everything we wanted. I was sweating after game one it was going to be a 3-0. But uh, T1 showed up on the day and, and gave us a super, super close best of five. Yeah, it was, it was incredible. Uh, it was absolutely incredible. One of the best series that, that I've ever watched. I think probably the best series that I've ever covered. Um, I absolutely loved it. I, I, just, I was so impressed not only by the fact that it was just like a close series, but by the fact that it, it felt like largely mistake free it felt like both teams had kind of really leveled up their gameplay I, i've got to say i was even more impressed by t1 because i had h such high expectations for dom one i was less surprised by how good they looked but i felt like t1 fixed a lot of their problems like it was such a meme with them just always doing these dumb herald fights they were doing actually like cross map trading really well they played side lanes really well um their laning was very good i think they were intelligent in how they were drafting largely like though you know there's maybe some debates in game five and stuff i think they kind of got baited a, a little bit out drafted by um by Aphelios being left open and then playing to this kind of long range comp but like this was just such a well played series that it was really a pleasure to watch i just i just loved it I mean, there's so much story so much history between these two teams and then for them to deliver at that high of a level it's one of the all-time great series yeah my one core tenant of all of my favorite series have been that there is an established dominant kind of overlord team yeah. and the shining underdog pushes them to five games yeah like it's it's kind of easy to write my favorite type of series you know it's going to be most people's because most people you know you want that story you want that push and pull there are, there are some key things that are always easy to include okay yeah so you need an underdog story you need the underdog to have this great improvement arc which skd yeah did this year they went through so much crazy stuff this year so many hardships to to get to where they are and the improvement was very real like you're saying and up until the last moment uh, these the, the rift herald plays are, are one symptom of it but also you know with a lot of these younger guys and especially like owner there'd be some games where like he completely pops off and is so good from ahead but then also makes some of these kind of more rookie-ish um, kind of green mistakes over chasing and, and stuff like that or not accounting where, Got where people are. a little of that from Kana where he's a bit nervous, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but um, so that that's one tenant. And another one for me is, is also always like champ select stuff, surprise factors that have not come out in the tournament so far. And I always remember, you know, like the Zyra support and Misfortune support exchanges in uh, the previous SKT one. But this one, also, funny enough, at support, I was so happy to see, you know, the, the Maokai and the Zillion exchanges. Mm -hmm. Just it gives it that next level when you're you're thinking through the different changes that they also have to make and how they want to approach strategy yeah. for the game. Because you need you need them performing individually these great mechanics and worlds level and you're just like in awe of some of the individual plays. But then layering on the other strategies on top of that just makes it feel like a complete package i think that this is such a good i don't know if it's 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 hard for me because this tournament's what's fresh in my mind so this is what really sticks out but this tournament and especially this best of five for draft was so thrilling not just because of the maokai zillion evolution but like the priority on lee sin and how lee sin developed over the point of series the fact well, that it's so, okay so here's the thing to me with because i really i really like the you know like Jin and 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 like lee sin emerging combination but lee sin is 99 percent presence it's so like the whole tournament he has been pick or ban. 
Yeah, no, 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 no. It's not like Lee Sin is a new pick. Yeah. But what was cool is like in the context of the story of this series, right? The fact that like Lee Sin looks broken in the hands of Kane and they give it to him anyway. And then there's this big question coming into game two. Owner gets Lee Sin, like how good is owner's Lee Sin going to be? Like we know, you know, he's had some decent shots on it domestically. He's had some good games overall. It's yeah. a great win rate. But then he pops off and it becomes this must man pick. And that's what I, yeah. one of my favorite things about best of fives. And this happens in a lot of best of fives, not just like iconic best of fives, but the evolution of draft. And I think that to me, as long as there's always this push, where nothing, like nothing, no lane matchup, nothing feels safe 100%. Because I mm-hmm. still remember one of the first best of fives I ever cast in my career was like H2K versus Splice, Gang playing first NAR five games in a row. It was so, it was also 2016. 2016 meta in EU was very slow and very boring. But like that, that killed me. And in this series, while there were some established power picks, the evolution of that is so, so fascinating to watch. And honestly, something I did not think we would get to see when it was two teams that had played each other so much domestically, I thought we would settle in to establish meta super, super quick. So just adding on to what you guys say, like to me, the fact that this delivered in such a huge, fantastic way is like doubly surprising when these teams have, you know, so much history against each other. Mm Because it's like, you really have to be hiding your secret tech for it to come out here, you know? Because like, most of the most of the remaining teams are LCK teams. You know, like you're scrimming maybe Gen G, maybe you're, one of these teams is scrimming Gen G, one of these streams is scrimming EDG. The likelihood of you sneaking a pick through at this stage of the tournament is like there's a master class to that kind of art, you know what I mean? And I it's it's crazy that they managed to make it happen. Yeah, that's why uh that's why it's always so cool when they do come out later in the tournament. Um and I've got some new good or some further good news for you. Showmaker, did you see if you saw his interview? I think it might have been with Ashley after, where he he was talking about having this giant bag of extra toys that he wants to use. He's such a troll. (laughs) It's just like, he is so good. How... This this guy is just literally just so perfect for for the show. Yeah, his name is Showmaker. Great choice, but just yeah. right off the bat. Also, you know, one of the best, if not the best, you know, mechanically gifted and and just individual players and players yeah. in the game. But then he's also doing stuff like you know, fake punches at the camera, throwing different looks, giving like growling at the camera. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's like he has so <laughs> much confidence. And you're just like, you, you have to be drawn to it because he should be. And people are always drawn to who, who is, you know, top of the of the pyramid. And and being able to really embrace that is just is so fun. You yeah, know? It, it is really fun. I mean, he, he's been he's been a delight to watch over, over the last couple of years as he's gotten more and more confident, doing more spicy interviews, yeah. showing more personality. I just absolutely love it. Um and, and yeah, I mean, it was, it was just, it was such a fun series to watch, you know, and, and I, I kind of agree with you because it's like the first, the, the evolution of even just the Lee Sin, because the first two games, it was obviously not banned. Mm-hmm. And then it became a must ban after that. Jin won all four games it was played in, you know, that evolution leading to leaving Aphelios up and almost like baiting T1 into playing this Aphelios comp that would then be outranged and have kind of a lack of engage. Um, you know, even the adaptation, I think. The, the game three that Zillion got brought out, like I remember when I was casting that, I was like, okay, they actually just like hard win this in, in late game. And it, it's really cool because it's this principle and I've been feeling like Zillion could have been brought out against Yumi. I didn't really expect it to be brought out in this exact scenario, but it's the whole concept, if you play RTS, of essentially like out greeting your opponent, right? It's the idea of, I think most people look at it in League where someone goes scaling pick, you go early game pick, you kill scaling pick, right? That's most people's thought process. Um, but in, in RTS, there's a, a lot of strategies where it's like someone goes for one one quick expansion okay well you take two quick bases right and you essentially outgreed them and i think zillion is is the best scaling support in the game and if you can't punish it in lane it has so much value but particularly into dom one's comp that game where it's like really burst heavy single target focus you know they're using the mf alt the syndra alt the j4 alt, all these things to one shot somebody they were just like checkmated by this pick. They couldn't actually slow roll these fights and try to spread damage around. They needed to burst someone out and Zillion just denied it completely. So I just thought it was such a brilliant pick in game three. In game five, less so because it was like non-committal poke and they were able to like one-shot you with Zoe and Ziggs and stuff and force out alts that didn't have high value, um, which again is is a really nice adaptation from Dom One and just shows how flexible they are. Yeah, see to me that that was the, the cool part about it because it wasn't necess- necessarily just like like, ooh, scaling or versus early game, it was this revival versus all in commitment, basically. Yep. And yep. having and and just recognizing the strategy that is thrown down in front of you and having the answer to those strategies. 
that's the that's the change that I love in best of fives. You know, when you do get the multiple answers, and and it it and it actually gets reversed in the end. You know, throwing down. Okay, so you guys are super hard engaged, and you're and you're winning these all in team fights. Boom, Zillion counters that because we have the revive for you know yeah. for all this close range. And then they're like, oh yeah, nice Zillion. Boom, longer range. Now we're not <laughs> even going to go into the you know uh, all in team fights. And I was just like, yes, I love the multi layer things. I think it's something that we miss out on a lot in League of Legends. Because, like, if you compare to Dota, there's so many champions that just hard counter based on kit alone other champions and can just shut down. Like, this is a much more common theme where it's, like, counterpick, 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 because the game just has such sharp counters. Like, champions can just shut down other champions 100%. It's rare in League that we really get that. Like, there are favorable matchups, but there are rarely champions who are like, oh, from the get-go, you can do nothing against this champion. So when you do see zillion in this context which i i think you could probably say is literally the perfect pick in the context of this draft hard counter in such a cool way it's just honestly fantastic to see yeah the other thing i was going to bring up is that it is some of the idea around game balance of the debate between longer duration between patches or yeah. having very short duration is that yes people will jump on something that is very strong immediately but some of the arguments for you know other games that have a much longer periods between patches cough, melee, has cough. been yeah <laughs> has been <laughs> has been the evolution of allowing the natural process of people to come up with counters to what is super strong what is the meta yeah. which stands for the what most effective tactics available is uh, that what meta stands it, for it's actually literally the the um, what it stands for Oh, I never knew that. So if the most effective tactic available that is agreed upon right after a patch, a lot of the arguments have been you just need some time for people to innovate. And then when everyone does this, yeah. the people that are so rewarded for reaching deeper and really finding and digging into how can I counter this strategy? And those eureka moments for me is what I'm referring to in, in that ingredient and what makes the best type of series for me. It's like, that just feels so good, yeah. you know? It, it is such a trade-off though, because if you go for, you know, stable meta and don't patch, then for people at home, the game can become more stale. And yeah. even though those individual moments where there is the innovation are more exciting, there is much longer stretches of, oh, well, most people agree it's GP NAR. Yeah, we're yeah. gonna play GP NAR for ninety five percent of the games, and then that one game, then something else comes out. Like, oh my god! But then it's no, kind of back to win, the NAR but then it's kind of back to the GP NAR, right? Yeah. Um, but but I agree, it is really interesting, and I'm, actually, like over these last couple of years in pro sports, there's been such a, a big change in, in that, and it kind of demonstrated it, right? You look at basketball, you look at American football, um, you know, the rise of three pointers in the NBA that, that has completely essentially changed like the prototypical players, right? You can't have these like slow centers who are just standing under the basket anymore. You need to be able to play perimeter defense. You need to be able to shoot. And in the NFL, essentially the, the math behind two point conversions, people actually realizing, you know, even though you are going to fail more often, two point conversions have become so much more frequent over these last couple of years yeah. because people are realizing that like mathematically it's just a better play even though you know the point after is, is kind of guarantee um so it's just so interesting because those are those are sports obviously that have have been the same for so long and just like certain players coming in and people challenging the conventions can cause these evolutions that are these kind of like eureka moments right which is really really cool when it happens yeah i think obviously there's always and this is not and no part of this is meant to be a dig on on the balance team because it is We've talked to balance team. I, mean, I know you guys have talked a lot about balance, and you've had your time um, playtesting. I'm well. not even suggesting that we change our patch duration. Or no, anything. no, no. I, I know. I just yeah, using that as an example. It's always it's always difficult to balance the multifaceted nature of the highest level, the NFL, to your touch football, right? And that's that's the infinite yeah. struggle. If I'm down here <laughs> playing touch football, we're playing peewee. We're just we're a little play, squad of kids really running around broken, together. But yeah. You well, want to buff him for pro? We're gonna have some problems, <laughs> brother. It's like not gonna work out the way you want it to. And the direct correlation is like, oh well, so it's because they realized in the NFL that there's a 63 percent chance of converting on the two points. So wow, that just is better than one point every time on average. But in my home flag football game, our conversion rate is two percent yeah. ever. <laughs> <laughs> and we're trying to apply the strategy and we're just like, why are we winning? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Don't well, copy paste on the homework. You know, context was, is important. It was an incredible series. Uh, obviously, EDG, uh, they had a really good series as well. Um, you know, against Genji, that that one actually ended up being very exciting. And you got to cast that one. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, that one too, um, we were also kind of worried because of the way that the overall tournament is going. It's been so LCK dominated. Yep. Um, so I was also a bit happy just to have some more variation in the tournament, to have EDG have a really strong game one and game five specifically. In the middle is where it was super exciting, back and forth, and and Genji's making you know these big moves. But I was also kind of glad that EDG had this growth kind of arc over their own series. And in the final game, we see Mako shedding the enchanters. I was so happy to see this variation of them. Yes. Because he had oh. played upward from eight to 11 uh, enchanter games in a row. And he finally pulls back out the Leona and you're just like, yes, this is, this is the EDG that you want to see, pushing it forward, making these proactive plays. And they have JJ gank mid, transition the mid pressure into bottom lane pressure and, and show some of these these ways that can, you know, work for them in the finals. So mm -hmm. I was really happy also that it, it built up kind of to a crescendo there. Yeah, and I think credit to Genji for um, playing, for bringing it back after that after that game one. Because I, I was in again, and mm -hmm. I'm the eternal pessimist. So I see a dominant game one, I'm like, but it's three up, it's done, it's, done. <laughs> it's over, it's, we're going home. You know, I was so stressed out on the on our series, because I was like, please, all we wanted was five <laughs> games, don't want Kia, you know, and then obviously T1 shows up a big way, and Genji did, and yeah. it was, interestingly enough, with the same comfort picks, that everyone on the, this is like the easiest the Renekton, Buzzfeed level yeah. criticism you can give to Gen G is just they play the same yeah. crap all the time. And Renekton, as you've highlighted so many times, has been gutted. My yeah. God, just numbers alone, this champion looks so bad. Yeah. But then we had multi, I think multiple solo kills. This was uh, <laughs> yeah. This was big. I mean, Rascal knows what he's doing. That's what I'll say. Like, there's a reason it's a comfort pick. Yeah. Well, and the solo kill that came after a full lane, lane phase of beating was him going into the brush and it and this has nothing to do you know that's not like a renekton thing that you can nerf this is like so much of him playing comfort on this and, and trying to be like oh he's gonna take a greedy path back up to lane here yeah. and i have to have this close range if i don't get to start my trade on close range you know with him passing by a brush <laughs> it's, it's all gonna fall apart and boom that single opportunity this is where i loved the story which is so much of like a fairy tale narrative of like just be true to yourself and play your champions <laughs> and you can do play it your game it's actually yeah just like yeah, believe like, in yourself you can accomplish anything yeah. and it's like you know we're gonna have bdd <laughs> just playing his bdd champs he's like ah screw twisted fate we're even bit. renekton can make the world yeah, final oh, rascal's man. like you know what Predicted. Boom, boom, boom. I don't care about you know all the the trifecta for top lane champions, but that was something that was so cool with Gen G, where they had been flamed so much. You're such a slow team. Everybody knows how you play. You do the same stuff all the time. Why can't you guys adapt? And that was just what their coach said. That's not even before. That's before <laughs> yeah. we get to Reddit. You know what I mean? Like, it, I I watched one of the Gen G. Um, uh, documentary things and it's just so funny to, to be able to reference that because it was like oh my god it was like he was <laughs> this really man goes in. It. It's like, but oh. they they stuck true oh, i thought you were memeing no no, no it's, it's he real. goes in i'm not I, oh memeing. my god yeah, i referenced that list. multiple times because i was like this is not just fans yeah this is them knowing this about themselves yeah. and yet they double down on it bdd has one of the most amazing tournament performances that we've seen in such a long time. So many hard carry performances and- He was incredible. Um, especially, yeah. you know, with the Zoe, but it was cool because we didn't just see it with this team. My other favorite example uh, for uh, for the like champion segment is crying and the Annie. And we even see like the evolution of this tournament is just like so player based where like they really operate in this way where he's got to roam and he's got to be these snap engages. And it's not about never about crying winning lane mm -hmm. and he's like you know what you're banning all of my crying style champions of his two all champions all, like that. <laughs> all i'll say kobe is that i'm glad that it we have another I, we have mm -hmm. another like but stick to yourself believe in yourself yeah. anime narrative but both of the both teams that lost, you brought yeah. up have won, have lost in the end well because the ideal <laughs> is I was that thinking the same thing the ideal is that you can play anything but yeah the, yeah they lost look where they look where they got though yeah you yeah know, semifinals so, one game from exactly, finals quarterfinals and semifinals so um i don't think when you're faced with this deficit of ah we're not Dom one. We literally can't play every single champion in every single way, you know, and, and have all, all of that. The way to get the most out of your cap 
basically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I feel like is is playing right into I, it. I mean, to me, it's it's always I would rather someone play a bad champion that they are extremely good at than a good champion that they're okay at. You know what I mean? And 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 that yeah. I think is is kind of like Gen G, and that's kind of rascal. As much as people want to uh, criticize him, I mean, game two was the most impressive because it was like he got dove, he got ganked a bunch. He's <laughs> he's into his graves. He's way down. And then he just solo kills the only winning lane that EDG had in game two. And it's like, oh, the game's over. Because th- their jungler was going bot side. You know, yeah. Genji, Clid was going bot side and actually putting the, the bot lane of EDG way behind. So they were already winning that. Mid's even. You put all your resources in getting your top lane ahead. And all of a sudden, Rascal yeah. you know, just finds that the angle to do it. And I think that is really impressive from him. Because as much as the, the pick, I don't think, is the strongest right now, he is really good at finding these flanks, at finding these fights. We saw that in both of their wins. Where it's often off of him, you know, finding these TP plays or finding these mm-hmm. angles that were really shutting the door on what what edg was trying to do i think it was it was either game one or game two he had that um play where scout is getting kind of corralled into him and he's just waiting in the side brush in the river and scout has to flash over the wall and then he's just in on him finishes him off and that was kind of like the game ending fight i can't remember yeah, if that was game I, two or game three neither, but, um, talking about. but you know it, they, they played really well and bdd to me especially like was the the biggest like his stocks went up the most for me of like almost anyone in this whole tournament, tournament because yeah. just throughout the whole tournament, I thought he was incredible. I thought BDD played one of one of the best series of games of anyone here easily. I, mean, I just wanted to jump in pretty quick because while the cool story is like, oh man, Rascal could beat up the whole game and then he finally solo kills. Ha, the game is over. Clid. Clid won that game. Yeah, so yeah, hard yeah, for yeah, yeah. <laughs> But just as a jungler, when you put all your resources into a lane and then that lane gets solo killed, you're like, all right, well, we lose. Yeah, it, it's definitely a giant, you know, <laughs> blow to the mental. Yeah. Um, but man, I Clid deserves so much uh, credit He's as smurfing. well this tournament because it, it was a lot of you know combination with 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 them too, and. Yeah, but we should probably talk some about EDG because they're still in the they're tournament. Still in the tournament. Yeah. yeah, I had another thing <laughs> lined up. There's a good interview out there with Ashley Kang and Horizon from BDD, I think after week one of groups or before the tournament started where he talks openly about those problems. And I'd yeah. say if you want to know yeah. more about Genji, that's a great interview to look at or the documentary that Kobe's talking about. But in the meantime, EDG, the, the victors of the series, the ones who truly held on. Yep. Power of friendship. That can be their narrative. They, they pulled it together. Uh, what, and one thing I, I will say I was actually really happy with was... I felt like a lot of people were talking about Flandre. It's like, yeah, Flandre only played Graves and Jace coming into this, but it's mm-hmm. because no one was forcing him on other stuff. It's yeah. different than the, some of the, than the situation with Gen.G and other situations. Like, I feel like he was unfairly being characterized as like this two trick. Yeah, and yeah. I'm like, if you watch the LPL, this guy plays everything. He played 24 different champions this year, right? Yep. It's not as though he can only play those two champions. He's playing them because they are incredibly strong and because they weren't being banned out. You can maybe criticize that, ah, he could have found some situations for different ones. Um, but I did like that he kind of like, you know, was able to shed uh, that storyline here a bit. He brought out a number of different pricks. He brought out the Kennen, the Jax. He brought out the Gwen. And I think that is critical because when you're, you're then heading into the finals against Khan, Khan has just been out of his mind. You know, one of the most yeah. dominant laners of the tournament easily. So I do think you need to be able to threaten these different types of matchups and these different picks that can come out and give you an edge over a player who is just playing so friggin' well. Yeah, I, I think people should never take these stories. And this is a pitfall of just because a player has been playing something recently doesn't mean they can't doesn't play other mean stuff. that people are saying you can't play that, right? Yeah. These yeah. are professional players at the highest level. So there are some individual specific ones that people will hone in on, like BDD and Twisted Fate and, and, or Cryon and some specific champions. But in a lot of cases, yeah, that, that thing gets latched onto because people are just looking at some most recent things. That being said, I feel like also people just love going to extremes. You oh, know, yeah. For, oh, yeah. either can't play it at all or is you know one trick of this style thing. There is a gray area and there's a ramping curb of you if you have not put in time recently and the time comfort. is such a, a a limiter here. Time is a very big thing that is is very scarce at Worlds yep. because your your practice time and everything is crunched down so small and it's so important that whatever you spent time on getting up on just recently and having a, a little bit at least of practice on something and being warm basically on a champion i think also does have at an effect when people go to the extremes of 
you know, one trick or or can't play at all. Though that's yeah, I know, think it's also it's also important in the context of when when champions are picked, right? Because if it's like you are using your first pick every game to secure this grace pick, and you're like doing middling on it, then I can understand some of the criticism because then it's like you're investing so much to get it. But more often than not, like. Yeah, Graves is banned a lot one, but they're not super prioritizing <laughs> Graves. Graves doesn't come out the bat swinging. It's like when it's time for them to pick a top laner in the context of their draft, if yeah. Graves is up, Graves is their comfortable blind pick, which I think it's it's not like this is the pick that like they have to pick Graves every single time. Um, and to me, it's just like it doesn't cost them anything, and it's the be- probably the best top lane champion, at least for blind picks in the game right Yeah, now. they very clearly had settled on, all right, we, we do need a blind pick top, and this is the best blind pick top in the meta and they want and, and it makes as well yeah and, and it makes sense because they they want to put a lot of resources into viper right? yeah and they always have so and and i think the, one of the other things that sometimes for me feels like it falls through cracks is people talk about you know like oh there's so much they're putting all this this these resources and getting an early pick but that's also freeing up other people to be able to see what the your opponents are drafting and sure. pick later right because having having second pick in top lane is a really big deal if you're trying to win your lane um there are power picks and this is a great blind pick power pick mm-hmm. um but i also do think there's something to be said for players who are able to perform consistently with blind picking every game because that gives so much ability for the rest of your team to get winning matchups to find winning lanes and to really find advantages in draft and that's something that i think often doesn't really get talked about a lot yeah well i think there's just there's always going to be a nuance when it comes to draft right yeah. it's like there's always an opportunity cost to picking anything at any point in a draft you're always giving something up but you're also also getting something in return for picking when you pick and like I'm not advocating for a blue, you know, blue side first pick Graves. I don't think that's where he's at in the meta. But if you're going to first pick Lee Sin, then maybe you're giving up Lucian. You know what I mean? There's always yeah. this given. Tr- Absolutely. Take, and no one, I'm not going to say no. One, but most people don't want to go into the depths of that conversation when it's much easier to just go, ah, another Graves games. Wish this guy would play something different. Graves feels, you know, meh. But. I- one thing I will say, though, is I thought Scout had a really freaking good series. Like, he played so well, actually. I mean, obviously, his Zoe game, everyone's going to gonna reference. Only The only game I didn't think he was playing really well was, like, that. I think it was game two. His, his first Rise game didn't go that great. Mm. But, like, every other game, he played really, really well. The Oriana game was good. The game five uh, Rise was really, really impressive. And I do think Scout's form is so important going into finals because it feels like it's it's all like the story is feeling somewhat reminiscent of of edg going into the finals against fpx where yeah haha do and be sucked at worlds but everyone everyone going into the lpl finals was basically on the hype train for do and be and and talking about how like this guy basically couldn't be stopped right he was running over everyone every single game in the lpl and i feel like there's a lot of similarities with with how people are talking about showmaker right now how showmaker is the best player in the world back then everyone's saying do and be the best player in the world and i'm not going to pretend that that you know edg is favored or anything like that but scout was able to rise to the occasion in the lpl finals and played incredible um, against against FPX across that series, he was twenty six four and twenty six against Doombe. So like that, that KDA isn't everything, but that was insane. And then it was just funny to me because I was just like having to be looking at his score lines for for this series twenty five six and twenty four. So like almost almost mirrored uh, score lines. Of course, uh, over an additional game as well. Um, but I did think he played he played a really really good series, and he's going to have to play an incredible series against Dom one if they want to be able to compete. Yeah. What's funny is I told that exact story for the matchup versus Gen G because of how well BDD was playing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, oh, this is just like, you know, when the other mid laner doing B was so hyped up going into finals and Scout rose to the occasion. He's going to have to do it here again. And he did it. Yeah. So it's just like, it, it keep, if it keeps on being this theme, it keeps on being this this uh, you know this story for him. This is just his arc now, and it, and it shows how important he is to EDG's success, right? Like everyone kind of believes in the bot lane. I think JJ is is one of the biggest question marks. I think JJ has had a pretty good tournament for his standards, but also, and we can probably start just talking yeah, kind of just, about finals. Yeah, um, but it's like. Ooh, but it's Canyon though, right? And we were kind of joking about this, at, and you know we we're talking about. Uh, you know, I was saying how I think a big reason that EDG is putting such high priority on J4 is because they want to have Mako on on these Enchanter supports, and Mako traditionally was the go guy in the LPL, right? Yep. He played very lane focused, even on engaged support, so he was a little bit different than the roaming engaged support. Like he had a lot of duo procs in bot lane because they play through bot, but still, when it came to team fight, he was the he was the go button. And now I feel like they're putting JJ on on J4 to do that, and Kobe's like. Well, but you could just do that on least in. I'm like, well, but it's so much harder. He's like, well, Canyon can do it. And I'm like, 
not yeah, fair. Yeah, that's you know? not the standard like, we can judge people yeah. on. And it's like, but oh wait, yes, this is the one time that is the standard we can judge yeah. someone on because that is literally the person <laughs> you saw have to outperform. I saw Clyde do it. Looks you know, easy. Canyon, Canyon does it every time. Yeah. But it's it's so cool because you have to be so good with Lee Sin to be able to get these engages. But the players that we have at Worlds are that good yeah and so that's the stuff i want to see yeah i, I think we should just get right into absolutely, it absolutely yeah we're into picks, it we're, we're into, into it picks, picks and bands we're are, all up in it picks and bands are so interesting for this because there have been tendencies that both teams have stuck to mm -hmm. that are on different sides of the map for their picks and bands yeah. uh, because everybody right now is is banning out so much of twisted fate yumi uh, a lot of leeson sometimes it gets through but like aphelios or one part of the lucian nami yeah. so a lot of this stuff is hotly contested as far as especially red side bands are kind of pinned in there um, depending on your opponent but so much priority for edg on that lucian nami and then having so much success in both of their winning games off of bottom side yeah is i feel like adds more more variety to their bottom side picks and more threat. Whereas on the side of Dom one, you're a little restricted on your bottom side. When we saw the the Jin priority just blown out of the water versus uh, T1 and Dom one. So I feel like it's a little bit more restricted because Ghost is so good for Dom one in this very specific way. And so Jin I think is so big for him, but also the Ziggs, and there's not a lot of, of of picks that kind of play into that exact sort of style. So I think that Viper and EDG wanting to win hard down there is going to be one thing where you can you contrast that on the top side. EDG are way more constricted. Yeah, there was like six, eight Jarvan picks in a row for JJ, and already mentioning Flandre doing a lot of graves. So that's a lot of double AD top side and Jarvan also very specific there. So. Yeah. It feels like on the top side of the map, Dom Juan are so flexible. Kanan can literally play anything. You know, Khan as well has played so many different. And and that's why we see, I think, a difference in, in what the they're banning, right? Because it's like you're saying, you know, EDG wants to play these enchanter bots. Um, so EDG is not actually banning Nami at all. They're banning Lee Sin more. Uh, you know, and then you look over on the on the other side, Dom Juan. 50% of their games, they've been Nami, right? Like they, they're yeah. actually banning a ton of Nami. They're banning a ton of, of Yumi, right? They're banning these champions more often than exactly. EDG. And you have Canyon. So it's like, guess what? You don't have to really care what the other jungler is playing. You <laughs> well, just play whatever and you kind of do well. So it's 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 just interesting to see that like reflected clearly through their strategy, but also their gameplay. Yeah, a couple things. I mean, so the Aphelios uh, is uh, the Yumi and the Twisted Fate feel like the two 100% mandatory bans. I yep. don't think we've seen a team really try to break that. And obviously a lot can change in a best of five. Someone has an ace up their sleeve. Aphelios is one that I'm still not entirely certain of, but obviously sets you up to play a really specific way. The one that's really interesting to me is Lucian Nami. For any team besides Damwon, it feels like you ban either one, then the other one is essentially banned, right? Like no one's going to pick it. But since yeah, they the have Connell played play it solo top. lane, yeah. which I don't think is good for the record. I, I just don't. I think it's fine. But he got a pentakill. But he did get a pentakill. He got a pentakill, okay, Draco. Right. I'm not sure if you saw the game, I, I, okay, but he got a right, pentakill. All right, that's fine. That's fine. So that's kind of an interesting adaptation. And so much that comes down to what they want to target. Because there are so many teams that would just ban LeBlanc. Yeah. But like, if anyone is going to pick the, the Lissandra counter pick, for sure it's an LPL mid laner, right? For sure. Scout has way more experience on that domestically. It's, it's funny because I mean? especially when you, if you look at his champion pool for, uh, for the tournament, it's like six rise. And then one, 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 one of <laughs> every other champion. So he's like, yeah. Yeah, he'll play everything. Clearly, EDG have this strategy Ten in, in picks bands. Game. Exactly. He, they have this strategy where they for sure hone in on one champion or two champions and have the, just such a big, everyone agrees upon, oh yeah, this is the best for us. I mean, and that is the Jarvan. That is the Graves. Yeah, that is the Rise. If you predict their draft, it's literally Graves, it, Jarvan, Rise, Lucian, Nami. Like that's the most, that's yeah. the quintessential EG5 stack. again, to the earlier point, it doesn't mean that they cannot play these other ones as evidenced by his literally 10 other champions with single plays depending on what the team needs and and that's why i wonder if they will stray from comfort coming into finals you know do you think that you are on the level of of dom one if you are on edg to, to where you can just say yeah we'll just do our tried and true we'll play into it we'll just play stock standard or do they feel like hey dom one has us outmatched a bit let's take some shots because 
you know, EDG is a team that, you know, is, is has a lot of patterns, right? And this is something um, we can actually bring up the graphics now, Phil, um, that I've, I've noticed from EDG for all, all year long. I watched this in the LPL yeah. and I watched it at Worlds and I was like, let me actually like get, check my biases here a bit because EDG, I think one of the reasons that they're so good at team fighting, their positioning in team fighting to me is, is really, really interesting. They almost always will go into this essentially little kind of like concave. They're in a spread line. They go into this concave and what they do is essentially you, you have this line here, right? If someone comes in, from the other team, the mm -hmm. sides of the line collapse on that person and they focus this person down. And they almost always will start their team fights like this. And we can start kind of cycling through a number of these graphics. This is These are all literally just setups from the Gen G series that they just played. And so I went I went through and I watched this and I found, I don't know, 12, 15, whatever examples of them doing this line before a team fight. They do it all in the LPL, they do it at Worlds. And, and it's really interesting because it does make it very difficult to actually engage onto them because they're spread out and if you engage on one point, the other parts of the line collapse and they actually will, will focus fire you down. Whether or not it's it's ideal to always do is very <laughs> debatable um, because, you know, other teams and a lot of these pictures, even Gen G, you'll see won't actually be like sometimes they'll be in a clump. Sometimes they'll be split three, two. Sometimes they'll have, be in one, four with someone flanking. Uh, EDG almost always will try to play it like this. And I just think it's really interesting to see that this pattern and it's it's something that I attribute a lot of their success to is the patterns that they use. They very clearly have have not only champions that they default to that they really like to play, but they have set formations. They have set standard plays and setups for each of their team fights, which I just think is is so, so interesting to watch. Because if you watch almost any EDG team fight ever, you will see this line at some point. And League of Legends isn't is it's not like a perfect game. So I'm not saying that they're gonna move like this perfect arc yeah, at all yeah, times. Yeah. It's not a hex based strategy. No, not, it's not turn based. You know, people not like move forward up. and back, yeah, yeah, yeah. and 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 it, it it does dissipate. But in almost every single team fight you'll watch from EDG, if it's five v five, you will see this at some point where they are in this setup, like that is how they start the fights. And very clearly they're communicating it, very clearly they're doing it. Even sometimes in some of those pictures, you'd see it over walls. If Scout feels he's too close to the team, he'll go stand on the other side of the wall in the river just so that they can still have this spread line. And I just think it's it's so cool to see those patterns from one of the best team fighting teams in the world. And it's there's gonna be so much where it's like, ah, but dumb one, but dumb one, but dumb one. Well, EDG made the world finals. They yeah. are so good. And this is one of the things that I think is, is a core component to that. Yeah. And I think one of the things with this outline and setup for fights is that it does depend a lot on champions for, you know, for both sides because it is about ranges. Yep. Right? So sometimes you're going to need a slightly different positioning for peeling for X carry. A general rule of thumb in a lot of situations is to have at least the carries spread mm -hmm. out in this in this sort of style because and and especially you, I'm, you can relate to this because you've also been playing a lot of fives in arena recently in <laughs> world of warcraft arena <laughs> if you play a five dps five range yeah a big part of the strategy is pulling your opponent out into the open yep. and then focus fire yep right and so it's it's one of the age-old tactics is just so common when you have these range advantages and you have you have lots of dps Focus fire means everything and burning down a target. And so this is a way of like luring out or getting that target exposed and not ha being no, able to have I'm, I don't retreat. like this. Take me back I, to the Napoleon era, the column where you just lined them up. And an the honorable gun, the, battle. The, the guns didn't shoot fast enough and the column kept and, coming and eventually the column won, boys. That's how I want to play. <laughs> Two lines facing each other, honorable yeah. warfare. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just so cool. It's kind of, if, if people have watched... Um, I saw your eyes light up when I missed the read it thing. If people have watched Core JJ, he did like a 2v2. He did some, some really cool YouTube videos on, yeah. on talking about 2v2. And one of his course concepts was kind of like this like a little triangle basically where it's the idea that if the enemy support engages essentially and like you two can be hitting the enemy ad but they can they can't be hitting you like it, it's this this idea of like the angles right where it's mm -hmm. like okay you want to go on viper resolution so the leeson goes forward to try to engage on him well guess what by doing so all, you're now in range of all five members of EDG, but he has stepped forward to do this. And so the Lucian isn't actually in range of all the members on his team. So you essentially get your advantage through doing that. And like yeah. that is the core concept here in the strategy. Yeah. Um, at the graphics are obviously kind of janky because I, I literally wasn't. This was just for my own personal use. I was watching yeah. this and I was just doing screen we were, cuts. We were, we were literally and, and warming MS up Paint today. Lines. He's like, I've got this idea. I was like, put them in the screen. Yeah. It's like, they're crap. I'm like, I don't care. It's cool. It's interesting. Yeah. I think crap it's crap so cool. There. I was getting really excited watching this. I was like, there it is again. It's the line. It's Look the line. at it. It's a pattern. Yeah, that's, that's it's, why I was like, the best way to do it is a collage. Just have a whole bunch. Yeah. Because all people need to focus on is like, ooh, the, 
the same curve. There's this yellow curve. Okay, I like curve. I the like best curve. part is if you're in podcast land and you can't see the graphic, it just sounds <laughs> like Isaac's slowly losing his mind. He's like, yeah. I see the curve. I see it every see single it. name. There. Pepe Sylvia. Pepe Sylvia. The table. What is it? What the is table it? has a curve. Oh, you now, the bubble. Now for the Dom Juan foot to fall. Yeah. All right. <laughs> because reviewing the, the Dom Juan games too is there. there is this, it's just so cool to watch so many of their disengages from team fights one of the things i wanted to hype up for them is it's a similar idea it's just that they're so dynamic in how they do it and not as much set Mm -hmm. is they're so good at extracting people from poor dangerous scenarios and choosing the moment to turn when they turn it is everybody boom split second and i like that they released just even some little bits of the mic checks are so Their clear. Are it's crazy, crazy for this team. They've even got Barrel talking to Ghost and be like, save your E for this and these little things. And there is very little necessity for them to, when you hear a lot of other teams, it's just like, oh yeah, yeah, kill Lucian, 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 no, that, that sort of thing. That was the PG version of most of what we hear yeah. all the last. <laughs> uh, but they're just so much clearer and it is like one or two maybe sometimes calling out target, but a lot of I can turn here or two Look seconds for the poke, or for wait this. for this yeah. or play cautiously or slow this or, you know, that that type of stuff. I was just like, oh, my God, this is why they are so clean in a lot of these opportunities where you think you've caught someone. They're escaping, but they kite the perfect moment or someone's talking to the other one about they have these cooldowns ready to yeah. this big turn. I think, yeah, I think the truly the, at least the most entertaining uh, metas and fights to watch are fights that aren't over in an instant, aren't just mm-hmm. a J4 ulting in an MF combo. And that's a perfectly viable. Some of the most the satisfying game. are just like, oh. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I what love, about Faker's Shockwave? It found them all. It well, did find them all. And that was you. quickly that was ended. A great call. And, and you're going to tell me that wasn't exciting no, during that was, was great. Right, I'm just saying, that, like, I think, I think <laughs> as a team communication point, because like I, one of the things, because obviously when G2 was good, I, we had to study as much as we could on what made them good so we could talk about it as much as humanly possible yeah. before they missed Worlds Rip. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's a similar thing that when you play these long team fights and every single player understands generally what the people on their team want to be doing, the major cooldowns that they need to fight around. And you saw this a ton yeah. in Silas to Kali Mara, where it's like everyone on the team is waiting for Silas's W to come off cooldown. And when that is up and his cooldowns are back up, then they turn. And so it's like that jump in, maybe try to finish one guy, maybe almost finish one guy, jump out this like in and out. I mean, I, guerrilla warfare is not the right word, but this kind of like these delayed extended fights forth, where yeah. you're playing around your cooldowns to just like the millisecond are such a pleasure to watch. And I think you, you see Damwon do it where there are times where, yes, it is just a Zoe bubble. They just find the poke. They just kill someone and they take over the fight. Yeah. But then when it's slower, more controlled fight and they're picking at the side, poking over here and they're just dismantling people, that stuff is so, one, entertaining to watch and two, also terrifying to try to imagine playing as a team that's that good at it. And another tenant here too that i always find so interesting and i first noticed it when i was watching the shy in his prime and the shy in his prime would never give up basically on a play and that leads to all those crazy individual outplays this isn't always you know team coordination stuff this is literally every player using every movement and trying to use every ability and movement to survive yeah he knows he's in the fight at five percent he knows he has 10 hp and he's going to die but he's he's fighting like like he's going to live, and then in the time where he does live, it's this miraculous outplay, and you're like, oh my god, how does he win those? He's yeah. playing the yep. you know Callista top or Lucian top think- to the extreme. He actually turned that around. What he got that kill? What the triumph feel? Oh, the, those things are are when you're pushing it to the maximum. And I saw this with Canyon. In the his Lee Sin games, oh my god! His Lee Sin games, but even when I was looking back at the LCK finals, and there was the one where Faker is chasing him, flashes after him with the Azir, and he's literally on Trundle with no W, so you can't do anything but walk. You're literally just a troll walking around, and Faker flashes at him, Azir dashes, and he walks perfect movement, dodges just barely out of the dash, then walks around the base gate and into the fog of war, and his one auto attack, and it's like. They don't get that kill. Faker's yeah. all of a sudden fully committed into the base with his flashbone and he dies and you're just like, boom, that's got to be game because that is just like, 
it's crazy. I think that there's there's so many things that as League of Legends has improved because there's always just points in the meta where we're gonna get the really simple five on five front line hits front line carries try to hit yep. the, try mm -hmm. carries hit front line. But there's always those moments, and this is like the LPL is also great at this. Another thing that EDG I think has done well historically, not just a cur not just the curvy line, not just always having this it's nice conflict. The, the curvy line is the core, but the, yeah. also knowing your limits perfectly that like. Well, why are you guys engaging this 3v4? It's like, well, because we can buy 10 seconds, and in those 10 seconds, our AD carry is going to show up. They're not going to have any cooldowns if they want to kill us, and he's going to kill everybody. Those those kind of extended plays, mm -hmm. these kind of things that are more simple than just line of skirmish, 5v5, line up with your muskets, let's see who hits their shots. You know what I mean? Like yeah. That's the kind of stuff that excites me greatly, and I think the potential for this final to be exciting is a team that is truly great at team fighting, a team that is truly great at everything. not letting you at everything and not letting <laughs> you play the game you want to play is is the dream version of this final but i think we might not even get there that's yeah. what that's what truly scares me because skt or t1 excuse me <laughs> early game was legendary and don won proved they could weather the storm ghost was supposed to be a weak point he weathered the storm this man did not die yes he had to give up lane lane yes he had to give up cs advantages but it was never so massive he couldn't come back and so while yeah yeah edg can bust out a lucianami like that's going to be great for you but if you're not if ghost has already weathered the gumiyushi storm I believe Viper and Mako are scary, terrifying bot lane. Are they going to be so much better with these range-focused picks that they can really like lock that down as a weakness? I feel like it's just so hard for EDG to play the way that they have played domestically and even at Worlds to make it to this point against a team at the caliber of Don Juan Kia. It is, and I mean that that's that's why it's so hard to really bet on anyone against Don Juan because they have so few holes. Everyone keeps referencing, you know, their bot lane is this weakness, but like, I don't even really see it as a weakness. I, I think at MSI, that was, there was more yeah. weight to that. Yeah. I feel like since he came back in summer, he was good. I feel like he's been good all worlds. When, when you actually look at, at how he played against T1, yeah, he got down a little bit, but there was also a significant difference in jungle proximity. Like T1 was actually putting more resources there. Um, we're, we're seeing, you know, his support roaming away and barrels trying to get things done elsewhere. He and had zero times pre-15 in the entire series it's like that's incredible right like he yeah. is playing he is playing weak side he actually was playing weak side and he was he was up in gold on average he was down a little bit of farm and he never died like what more do you want like that was incredible and and it's it's just Domwon is so bulletproof in so many different ways you know you guys were talking about that game five and and to me that poke comp that game five was perfection pretty much from Domwon. I think if you take the nameplates off and you just and not to not to drag either of our leagues here. If you tell me that's an LEC game, I take the T1 comp every time. Because I just there are so few teams in the world that can play a composition out yeah. at that level necessary to win. And T1's composition, while I do think the Zillion pick was a little bit flawed in the scheme of things. They probably needed like, to engage. But... Yeah, they probably needed to engage. But like that comp, if you go late enough, I, it feels like in most for most teams in most parts of the world, it's just like a well, they've just outscaled you. Yeah, they have right? they have a Felios and a Zero. They got to late game, but Dalmon never missteps. They never let them in. And how, like, the biggest thing to me that's so terrifying is I know EDG at their best can team fight with Dalmon. Like, they can. But their setups are so much worse than Dalmon. Yeah. When, when you rewatch that series, and especially that game five, how Dalmon actually plays around T1's comp, playing through mid, moving into the river. And as soon as they ever had river control, like, T1 could never even approach. They could never even look for the fight because they position so effectively. They're, they're always on that edge where they keep you interested in engaging, but you're never actually close enough to get engaged on. And they have such a good amount of, of like control and vision denial where you know teams are having to walk in blind and it's like T1 has hit this point. They're really strong. They got all their items, but they can never even find a fight because Dom1 won't give it to you. And they played their win conditions so well. They play spread so well that if I you come in, you just get you you just get absolutely eviscerated. So no one can find these engages on them, and it's it's so tough when you can't get that set up. And I think while there is room for adaptation, right? And we could see two very different forms of both these teams in terms of what they're prioritizing. In obviously, like they're you don't expect them to just go to Super Saiyan, but what they focus on in the draft and what they prioritize, I'll say that this goes back to what we were talking about for EDG spot lane, where the only reliable engage coming through for this team, based on what they're prioritizing, is a J4. And that, against Don Juan Kia, does not feel like enough, because yeah. if he ever whiffs a cooldown, like, Don Juan will pick them apart in that fight, because that's all, like, that's all of their reliable CC, that's all of their setup, and yes, with Anami on your team, you have some nice disengage tools, you can hit a sick bubble here and there, but like, that pick, while it will set them up to dominate lane, that bot lane, maybe they can, not because Ghost is a weak player, but just because that, that bot lane is strong, build a huge advantage there. It's still so hard if Don are going to keep playing like this and are going to pick a comp like they did in game five where they can play at range, use non-committal CC. It just feels 
yeah, it just feels impossible with what EDG showed us at least. This is part of the reason why I'm so curious about the champ select and how the champ select is going to play out for the five game series because Ghost is so good for Dom One in in some specific ways. Yeah, and I want to see, you know, the the Jin priority is is peak, and yep. then the Zigs for for having that flexibility on bottom lane. You know, Jin has so much range for following on all these pick comps. And Ziggs has so much wave clear for clearing out on bottom and also having super long range to follow up on damage. Yeah. And if that is the tactic that EDG try and focus on, which a lot of people expect them to, and I think rightfully so, to focus on bottom lane, as it has been their greatest strength throughout this year for, for their success. There's been so many games off of Viper Mako. And um and and Don Juan have have invested a lot towards the top side of the map so i'm all i always look forward to seeing which way that balance goes early on because when you do have different sides of the map that have different weights basically yeah it, it always makes it really interesting and since it's a five game series you then get to see the correction if it comes out in game number one it doesn't work and you're like okay what's the backup here you know and and those levels of strategy that we talked about and i think to again because i think pick ban is the because it's so hard to know what you, like you can't really set expectations of the game without seeing the pick ban. So I feel like it's natural that we always come back here. But uh, there is room. Like, yes, a lot of the bans feel set. Ophelios, Yumi, Twisted Fate all feel pretty set. At least mm. Sin in this series feels pretty set. But you can pick what strategy you want to fight against. If you don't want to deal with the Lucian Nami bot lane, yes, it does mean giving up something else that is potentially more powerful. But if you just want to throw EDG off and you're done with Kia, you can ban a Lucian, you can ban a Nami. Similarly, you can ban a Jin. You can see, hey, what does Ghost look like when he isn't in this position? The MF games, to be fair, still looked fine. Doesn't seem like he's going to give up too much, but there is room in pick ban to, to force a different strategy, to force someone's hand a little bit. It's not... Six out of six bands are not locked, although admittedly three out of six is still a lot to have locked in, but it does feel like there is room. That's so why I feel like it was kind of pivotal, the game where Dom Juan let Guma Yusi's Aphelios through, yep. which is terrifying. And then knowingly, oh, they, they come in with the entire plan of outranging it and trying to play around. So like, there are scenarios where you can give up some of these necessary or perma-ban champions. Um, and, and then draft your strategy of your whole team comp and stuff around yeah. being able to to accommodate for that. So that's why I just, man, Damon has so many options. It just feels like they're so flexible, especially from the top side of the map, though, that they can run, they can run to out to, to ac accommodate for a lane ban by team. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's like, oh, shoot. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so interesting. But th that's why I think. You just have to accept that with Dom One and go in with a clear defined strategy and see if it works because it feels like that's the only way you're going to win, right? Um, you, you can ban the meta, but I'd almost rather see EDG just like not ban any of the OPs, focus one person and trade OPs. Yeah, I, I feel like that might be a, a better a better you know answer to it. If you're really thinking, okay, like Jin Ziggs, like these are really key to them, just like ban Jin Ziggs and Yumi or something, and and try try to like be willing to trade some of the other OPs and try to make something happen. Because I just don't think you can go into this confidently uh, with a standard with a standard comp with a standard draft. Dom One is more flexible. I think Dom One is is a superior team in their setups. I think that they team fight really just as well. It's hard to find any like individual edges for for EDG besides maybe the bot lane. Um, yeah. But you know that that was like the same story with with Gumushi and Karia, and it didn't really pan out for T1. But to T1's credit, it was an incredibly close series. But it, it's just it's just so interesting because it's funny. Like Dom would have been getting flamed so hard if they lost that game five. It's like you let through the fifteen and two of Felios in was, game five. Fair, I was, you idiots, you know. But it, it's basically what EDG did to T1 all those years ago at MSI with letting through Fakers, yeah. uh, undefeated LeBlanc, and you just say. Yeah, we're going to let through something that's OP, but we are going to craft our strategy for it, right? And I, I'd rather see, you know, EDG do some of this stuff where it's like, oh, okay, we think he's going to pick TF or whatever if we leave it up. So we are going to build our strategy around destroying this pick and, and trying to create an advantage through this one clear avenue of attack, right? Yep. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Okay, you can, you can you know, blame the pick ban, but, but likely... Dom one will just help play you. Yeah. One thing I also just really enjoy, I think everybody likes watching offense more than defense. Mm -hmm. And Dom one mm -hmm. can utilize 
like a full offense comp so incredibly well. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that Dave, our producer, said to me that I thought was was pretty funny, also related to, he's like, he was used to seeing so many of our of NA teams, you know, draft like a team fight comp similar to like SKT had, and then get outplayed by extra range and damage from from a team at Worlds. And he was like, man, it's just so frustrating when it happens to us. When you see that happen to T1 also at the hands of Dom1, then you're like, okay, acceptable. All right, acceptable. Yeah, acceptable. It, it happens, happens to, them to too. everybody's <laughs> But it's just like, you always want, because the teams that are so built around offense and range and you have to utilize your range and your offensive capabilities or else you get kind of rolled over like, like paper because if you get hard engaged on, yeah. Those are all funny because it's like you're playing with fire. It's the same idea of playing like a full agility character with this full damage. <laughs> That's exciting to see because yeah. if you get hit, <laughs> you're dead. Yeah. You can't take a hit. Yeah. The glass cannon is entertaining to watch yep. for sure, for sure. I think that one last shout out, and this is totally like bringing us back instead of forward for sure, but Gumi, you see how Aphelios, like, God bless. If you've ever played Aphelios, this man, please watch his replays. I don't know if his probe is out there. Probably is. You can get it. Get his probe. This man has the right guns all of the time. You have to plan that shit two minutes in advance. He's calling means, up right, the riot phone. Excuse that means like me, when they I say Harold, like, he's like, I'll have red, white in two minutes, sir. So he's just furiously auto-attack. He's pushing cues on minions to have the right guns every time. And it, you would think, oh, every pro does this. No, every pro does not do this. <laughs> I watched a game this season, sorry, Han Sama, where you have purple, red at a Baron fight and we're useless. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to do. It's something you have to plan minutes in advance. It's a difficult thing. One of the things I actually was watching um, one, of, one of his pro views and one of the things that i found interesting because everyone tries to obviously prep the guns but one of the things i thought was actually really clever that he was that he was doing was he was actually like uh, where he needed to hard swap and he only had one wave of minions instead of just autoing he was using his q and then just holding the wave until his q would come back off to actually dump all the ammo because he would only have access to this one wave and he would basically have had to like over push otherwise and and then be in danger so i just thought it was really smart just tank the wave use his q on cooldown as the only ability to clear this reset his gun had full ammo on his correct guns as a result for the start of the fight and you're just like okay yeah yeah, you know what you're doing. You're pretty it good. It won't make the plane ride hurt any less. We, <laughs> but we know. We respect the Aphelios. That's yeah. all I'll say. That is bold of down one to let it through, even if they did win in the end. Absolutely. I, I think... Predictions? Yeah, absolutely. Does he, who wants to go first? Because I don't think this is going to be a happy prediction for the LPL fans. I, I want to say 3-0 down one. I... I, but I, I, th- I do think that the EDG could could get a game. So I mean, three one. I know everyone always says it's a cop out thing, but I, I do feel like they could they could definitely win a game if they get ahead. They are really good from ahead, but if they are at parity or behind, I think they're going to get destroyed by Dom One, and it's so hard to get leads against Dom One. I just think what we've seen from EDG will be dismantled by Dom One, and if we start fishing into the realm of unknowns, like oh, you know, they could have a bag of tricks up their sleeves. I just believe more in the Dom one bag of tricks based on everything we've seen this tournament. So for me, it's a 3-0. Yes, I think there is a potential for four or even five games, depending on how these play out. If we get five, it's going to be a banger. I, f- I want five, don't get me wrong, but I just feel like Dom one are so far and away the the best team in the world right now, and I just don't me think too. EDG can compete. Yeah, I, I do think that EDG at least snowballs one game. So I, I'm going to go, you know, 3-1 because... I really do think they're at least they're going to snowball one. You know, they're actually going to just get they're really Vi- good with the Viper league. is Viper get Viper so fed. This guy has so much confidence in his in his movement. Sometimes, Sometimes too much. I at least cast her curse him. Last time I said that in the guy, I was like, oh my God, he keeps dashing forward and getting these big chunks on people. Look how confident he is. And, Boom, and then he gets in and you're like, <laughs> That is some confidence right there. Maybe a little bit of overconfidence with the amount of vision that you have, but. He really tries to extract the most. And back to the theme of you love just seeing full offense on the edge. Yeah. I feel like he does toe that line. You know, the, the AD carries that really try and get the most DPS out of out of every position and and thread that line of dangerous positioning is is always really cool to watch. Yeah. End of the day though, Donald favorites. I mean, if you're at home and you're like, you guys haven't considered this angle, I would love to hear it because to me it's like if EDG come out and win this, it's based on something that we have not seen yet. And I think it's that's like, there's nothing up. that I've seen that I'm really like 100% that I can bet on. That's why Dom1 just feels like the clear favorite to me. It's like, even the things that I've looked at it for EDG that have felt good, it's like, 
we just saw Don Wonkia survive something similar against T1. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're the odds on favorite. It's like almost no one is going to tell you that they're, they're predicting EDG to win. But I will, I will push back a little bit and say that, like, I do think that we have seen, you know, over, especially, you know, in the LPL and like in finals and stuff, we have seen them play to a level where you're like, okay, if they turn in their best games, then Absolutely. they could do it. Mm-hmm. Right. And I do believe that. But it, it, it's just really, really hard when it's like, you look at the average level of play between these two teams and the average level of play from Dom one has been so much higher, you know, because EDG needs to play with the lead. They're just so much worse when they're playing it even more behind than, yeah. than Dom one. And it's just so hard to create that advantage. But I, I can't like, I can understand the world in which they could win, but I just, I just don't think it's gonna happen. It's also again, and this is a factor that affects both teams, but it's the final week at worlds is so hard. Uh, and it depends, obviously, where you're located, but there's nobody's there. If they're scrimming, they have to scrim European teams or anyone who's still around. Most teams have headed home. Like the the last week of scrims, having talked to Western teams that have been doing, having talked to T2, having talked to um, Fnatic when they were doing it, it's really hard to get good scrims. Now, if you're based in China for, for the World Training Championship or you're based in Korea, a lot of times you'll get to play the scrims who are trying out new rosters and sometimes you can get good practice. But it's hard to get good practice ramping in. So to me, it's like I want to believe in that EDG that came in in the finals that showed us so much more. But, like, that has to come from them. That's not going to come from the practice, which I think makes it even that much harder. Play some A-Rams. Yeah. <laughs> I, heard, I heard that works. That's why I take cleanse every game because that's what I heard what the Shy does in A-Rams. That's, uh, that's my strategy. Yeah. yeah that, the that, Shy is the true not, hero. Not too many people following uh, the Shy anymore without <laughs> how the, the recent plays. Man. The Shy still believes in himself. You know, when you're, when, you're, yeah. when you're talking about how he fully commits to those plays, I was like, oh, he still does that. <laughs> just for the wrong place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How come he doesn't win them anymore? I just, um, you know, yeah. All that matters is he still believes himself. Believe in yourselves, or or that's the place to start. Um, I'm I'm a big the shy fan. I hope he comes. I hope he comes back to form. Yeah. He, he had a horrible year. This is the shy podcast. That's yeah. what people need to understand. This worlds is important. It, There's a final, but the shy is who we really. It's miss. because people just love watching you doing the improbable and the unexpected. But yeah, I, I, we got some of that from Vlandre. I hope he brings out some crazy picks that some, some of that stuff. Is, I, I think that is a possible way in for EDG. So I, I hope that they are going to be bold with their champion picks. I hope it's true across the board for all the drafts. I hope we get interesting games. I hope we get five games. That is the most important thing. But this has been Die For you, the final episode for Worlds. Thank you so much for joining us across this entire session. Uh, Worlds this weekend, opening ceremony featuring tons of really cool, famous, talented people. Uh, and I've heard that there might even be a monologue to start off the day. Western fans, you'd <gasps> normally be sweating. But you don't have to be sweating because maybe it's for both sides. Maybe it's for one side. You don't know. Yeah. If you want to see, you have to show it's up. A monologue about the offseason. I'll do an hour long oh, monologue hour only about Dom monologue. That's actually the entire content yeah. for the one hour it's pre just show is just Isaiah monologuing about the Dom camera one. just slowly getting closer to my face yeah, throughout the hour but at an uncomfortably slow rate <laughs> yeah. if you watch it in double speed you'll notice otherwise you won't um we're gonna we're gonna write secret messages on his skin that you'll see when you get in real <laughs> we're gonna really try to curse we're him, really trying best, to yeah. curse so if you want to see that show up an hour early watch the pre-show there's an opening ceremony there's a cast isaac's gonna be on the desk kobe's gonna be on the caster desk do not miss it uh yeah Banger final. Five games. It's going to happen for sure. Ignore our predictions. Five games. 100%. This has been Diphoria. Goodbye.